Hey, my darling true crime angels, you made it tonight. Tonight, it's a special Sunday night edition of True Crime Tales with Trisha. We would have gone last night, but I had stuff going on, people. I'm busy. You know, just you got to accept it. It was just stuff. Maybe I might have been a little... Mm -mm, stuck, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, how's everybody doing? I'm glad you made it. ABD is here, Love and Coco, Luna Blue, uh, Louise Haraway, as well as Twin Mom 2011, Algo, how are you? Terry is here, Love and Coco, uh, Terry again, I hate chocolate, and the gang is here, Robin, Alicia, Debbie, DeShales, Mari Gold, Kathy Wright, Sherry Runs Late, Trisha Whistler. I mean, the gang is all here, and I am glad you are here. Because tonight, my darlings, in addition to having the uh, breathing blanket right here, this is this is Scrappy Joe. So if you see the blanket going up and down, don't panic. <clears throat> it's just him breathing, I promise. But tonight we have a tale for you. It's a tale of woe. It's a tale of murder. Or is it? Some people think there was no murder here at all. Just an overactive imagination of a psycho lady. And she is psycho. Others say, yeah, there was a serial killer. Two of them out on the loose. And they killed the most defenseless next to a baby. The most defenseless people on earth. People in nursing homes that were near the brink of death too weak to get out of bed. But did they kill them? I'm going to let you decide because I keep going back and forth. There's a book out there called Forever and Five Days. I would highly recommend it. It is by Lowell Cuffield. That's how the uh, recorder announcement, uh, excuse me, pronouncement says it. When you say, how do you pronounce this name? It went Cuffield. So anyway, uh, I'll just call him Lowell because, you know, we're close. Never met him. Anyway, he wrote this great book called Forever in Five Days because one of the women, uh, the main character, I'll call her Kathy Wood, wrote this awful poem and it ends with I'll love you forever in five days. And we'll read it here in just a little bit. But let's talk about these two women first. They're the center of this story. Kathy Wood claimed that growing up, she was ignored, that nobody loved her. And she claims that her first sexual experience was with a boy that turned out to be a girl. And she didn't know it. She didn't know it at all. Said it looked just like a boy. Didn't know until they, they got their clothes off. That's when she was an early teen. And uh, those around her say, no, she knew darn well that that was a girl. And she didn't care. But remember, this is the early 80s coming out was not something that you did, especially where she lived in uh, in Michigan. So part of this story is, is sad because we're going to talk about uh, the gay community here, and they couldn't come out, and they had to keep their secrets, which just led to other secrets. Now, thank goodness, it's not as bad, but there's still a lot of work to do. However, back in this, this takes place back in the late 80s, early 90s. So uh, not still not a good time for, uh, for coming out and being honest with about your sexuality. You want it to be, but it was those bigoted around you that gave you trouble. So Kathy Wood claims that she wasn't loved, claims that she was ignored. And I've told you before, my shrink has told me the hardest cases of child abuse is when a child is completely ignored. He said he could deal with anything else, but if a child is completely ignored, then they have no self-worth. They don't feel like they're worth anything, and it's hard to fix that when they're an adult. She claims that she was not loved and that she was completely ignored. We know a little bit more about uh, Gwen Graham, her, uh, her girlfriend. She grew up in Tyler, Texas. Yes, you knew Texas was going to be involved in this, right? Always. It always happens in Texas. And boy, her parents were just wackadoodles. It's in the dictionary. A wackadoodle of her parents. It's official. 
her dad was the, of the belief that if a baby cried, you didn't pick it up. You didn't try and comfort the baby. If, if a baby hurt himself or herself, you didn't try and comfort them. You never comfort a child ever, ever, because they would grow up to be weak. So the mom, uh, Gwen's mom said, okay, just let her cry and cry and cry. And her dad was the type of, oh, just one of those jerks, you know, made her watch him kill animals all growing up, you know, pigs, chickens, and get this. Now there's two stories here. Either of them are horrible. One story says that uh, Gwen's father said, come here, Gwen, we have to go kill that dog you love. That's all she had was this little dog. She loved it. But because the dog barked and it scared a horse and it threw the person riding the horse, the dad said they had to kill it. And one story says that she had to watch him kill her dog. Another story says her brother killed it and buried it. But either way, Gwen Graham ended up with the teeth and the skull of that little dog and she carried them everywhere with her because that was really the only thing she felt love from. And if you see pictures of her in court, she always wears short sleeves. Well, she has these horrible cigar and cigarette burns all over her. Now she said she did that to herself because she was trying to make herself ugly so that her father would not abuse her. And apparently she was horribly abused. Uh, years ago, when the dad was interviewed about it, he basically said, well, no matter what I say, you know, it's going to be horrible if I if, if I deny it, then my daughter's a liar. And I don't like that. And if I say that it's true, then then I'm a, a monster and I don't like that. So I'm just not going to say anything. Well, I kind of I kind of have a feeling on which side I fall on. Right. I hope probably feel the same way. Okay, so let me just make sure I've got their all of their uh, childhood figured out here. Um, Gwen was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and we've talked about that, very destructive personality disorder. And most people, most doctors in the industry, industry including myself, I am a doctor in my own mind, so I include me, my opinion. Uh, if you have a personality disorder, it is not something you can fix. It's like your eye color. And borderline personality disorder is really destructive. It's black or white. You're either with me or against me. It's very disruptive. And also she had uh, psychopathic features and she was unstable. You know, her moods just went up and down. And supposedly Kathy was diagnosed with uh, both a pathological personality with narcissistic behaviors, which just sounds terribly ugly and twice as hard to say. So both of these women coming together, yeah, not a pretty sight. But let's talk a little bit about Kathy. Kathy married a guy named Ken Wood. All right, she was 17. She had a baby when she was uh, 18. And this next little story I'm going to tell you about came when she was about 19. Okay. And this is from the book forever and five days. This is the mothering skills of Kathy Wood. Ken, now Ken is her husband. Ken almost caught the ball. They're at a ball game in the stands. Ken almost caught the ball. He was poised to grab the foul fly as it hurtled downward toward their seats behind the bullpen at Tiger Stadium. Then it drifted into the upper deck. Damn, he said, turning to his wife, Kathy. His wife was cowering in her seat, her eyebrows raised. She was peeking at, she was peeking at him behind the little body of their daughter, Jamie. Oh my goodness, but the book is her daughter, okay? Yeah. She was 13 months. Kathy had held up their only child as a shield from the foul fly ball. And he says, Nas, uh, nice maternal instincts, Kath. Yeah, Kathy didn't take much to motherhood either. Um, she didn't pay attention to her child, just like she wasn't paid attention to. Uh, never did any housework, didn't do anything, just sat around, smoked, and did nothing. <sighs> anyway, uh, the thing with Kathy is everything is drama, drama, drama. And I, I don't want to focus too much on the drama tonight because you can get all caught up in it. I would advise you to read the book because it is unbelievable what this woman was doing to her husband you know like he would uh she would get her friends to call him up 
and act like they were his old girlfriends. She'd be listening on the other line just to hear what he'd say. Things like that. It's just crazy. So anyway, finally, he said, we're getting a divorce. He picked up his daughter, thank goodness, took the little toddler with him and left. Now, the house that Kathy was living in was owned by her mother. And uh, I forgot a very important point. Before they divorced, Kathy actually did get a job. She got a job at Alpine Manor, which was this uh, nursing home in Grand Rapids. Now, um, I've worked like, I guess, it's considered the low paying jobs in the health industry. I worked at a place called Central Processing at a hospital in Salt Lake called St. Mark's. And that's that's the lowest of the low. You know, we were right, you got paid the, the least amount, which meant usually the people that had the jobs were young people getting ready to go away to college or whatever. So it was kind of always a young party crowd. Well, it was the same thing in Alpine Manor, except for some reason, this crowd was all about people coming out, coming out and, and de declaring they are gay. Because what started happening was people started experimenting with the same sex. And Kathy was at the hub of everything. She was like Queen Bee, matching people up, causing all this drama at uh, Alpine Manor, which, by the way, was a rest home. They had a lot of uh, very, very feeble and weak and basically on the edge of death elderly people there. And uh, she was a, a nurse's assistant, which meant she did all the hard stuff as well as Gwen. We'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, she was the center of this group of people that would always get together. They'd go party at this gay club. And she was all in their lives and, and trying to get them all to come out and have this person have an affair with this person. And she'd come home to Ken and say, oh, Ken, you won't believe just happened. She'd come rushing in the door early in the morning because she did the overnight shift. And Ken and the baby would be asleep and she'd wake them up and go, oh, we think... Think, we think Paul's gay. He thinks he's gay. I don't know. What do you think? He's like, I don't care. Well, so when Ken left, Kathy didn't miss a beat. Her house became parte central. Okay. Now, remember I told you at the beginning, Kathy just didn't do anything with the house. She couldn't care less. Well, she had such a, a personality that Kathy was able to get out of this big group of people partying that she would bring to her house almost every night. She got two of them once a week to be handy and dandy, and she'd call it handy dandy day. And that would be when two people would go in and clean her truck. She had a love truck and clean her house. And it was like this extreme cleaning. So she went from being a total slob to extreme cleaning, but only because she could get somebody else to do it. Okay. But here's the thing about these parties. These weren't your usual turn up the stereo over oh, too loud. The neighbors are going to get angry. No. These parties turned into orgies and they turned into brawls, people in the street brawling, mostly women. Cops would be called all the time. And, uh, and then sometimes Kathy would have everybody from Alpine Manor over, the ones in her group, her core group. And they'd be partying, the you know record player, that's how old I am, stereo was on playing records and people were dancing. And a lot of times people jumped up on her coffee table and would dance not unusual at all. This one woman jumped up one time, Kathy freaked out, get out of my house, everybody get out of my house. And then, you know, for two weeks, she didn't have a party. Nobody knew why, but it gets worse. So she finally hooks up with Gwen. Now, Gwen is a tough, low IQ, but very sweet woman. I, I'm trying to give you a good description of her. She felt that Kathy was her property and she would beat up anybody that looked at Kathy and Kathy was hers. And she was used to the rough and tumble life because that's how she grew up. But in her hometown, of course, in Tyler, Texas, which she wasn't anywhere near, nobody knew Gwen was gay. Okay. Their relationship was so sick and so twisted that one time, Kathy, and this all enters into this story, which is why I'm telling you. Kathy actually got Gwen, tied her up on the bed, do the s &M thing, and then took a loaded gun and stuck it in her foo-foo-foo-foo-foo-foo-foo-foo. 
And you know where I mean? Yeah. Because she was mad at her. She said she was going to shoot it. She's nuts. Just nuts. Okay, so. Here's, and I, I mean, I'm skipping over so much stuff. You can't believe it. It's, there's so much drama and it's, you're on the edge of your seat reading this book. So, but we got to keep, got to keep uh, to the, uh, to the storyline here. Now, when an elderly person dies in a place like, um, like the manor here, hold on, let me get my notes. I forgot my notes. Where did my notes go? Where did my notes go? No, 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 no. Alpine Manor. When an elderly person dies in Alpine Manor in places like it, nobody pays any attention. A lot of times they don't even have family to come pick them up. So nobody noticed that patients were dying and they were dying on the times that um, Gwen and Kathy were scheduled to work. However, the death rate did not go up at all. It just happened that these people died that are in question. Some people say five, some people say six. It, literally, it goes back and forth. I'm just going to say five. Five people that died every time that the five in question, Kathy and Gwen, were on that shift when they died. But that's not unusual. Okay? Not unusual at all. What is unusual is that several people that died had tried to tell others that Kathy and Gwen were trying to kill them. I'm going to read to you. This is chapter 38 from Forever in Five Days, Lowell Cuffield. The red light flashing above the room of the patient named Clara Pierce. It was after midnight. LaDonna Stearns turned into the doorway and the screaming began. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. Clara was restrained to her bed rails, her eyes wide with terror. LaDonna tried to calm her. No one's going to kill you, Clara. No one. No, they are going to kill me. They whisper to me. They whisper that they're going to kill me. She's escorted to her bathroom, reassuring her again. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. LaDonna, that's the uh, nurse's aide. LaDonna considered it an unfortunate delusion of the 87-year-old patient admitted six years ago with a diagnosis of organic brain syndrome. She had always liked Clara, though she was marginally confused. The terror had only begun recently in the, re let's see, in the winter after she fell while she was walking. Her doctor had ordered her bed restraints to keep her from getting up. She was prone to wander. She could injure herself again. They're going to kill me. Come on, Clara. It's okay. It's okay. LaDonna laid her on her bed. They're going to kill me. Clara, shh. She wrapped the thick felt bracelet around her wrist. Please, they're coming to kill me. Finally, LaDonna had lost her uh, patience and said, Clara, please shut up. Please help me. They're going to kill me. Please, please, please. The noise filled Camelot, that was the name of the section that Clara was in. By February, everybody was used to it. She wasn't the only one at Alpine Manor that was saying she was going to be killed and that people come and whisper that they're going to kill them. Because if you believe this story, it's exactly what Kathy Wood did and Gwen, depending on who you believe, okay? So, Kathy has no part of her daughter's life, which by the way, her daughter as an adult called the Howard Stern Show to talk about it. I was actually listening and I, they don't have that, uh, that bit out anywhere, but she's an adult now and she just talked about what a piece of crap her mother is. Her mother's out now, we'll get to that in a minute. But um, she, said that she was just horrible and you know she tried to have a relationship when she was a teenager with her and just couldn't because she's just so disruptive and a liar and causes problems she said she didn't like her dad either who apparently had passed so i would love to find out her story and have her on here i can't even begin to 
figure out her name because these names in the book, with the exception of uh, Kathy and Gwen, they're all made up and Ken, they're all made up. So anyway, okay. So Gwen and Kathy had this very volatile relationship where they would almost beat each other up and then have sex. And supposedly to relieve tension, they would plan killings. And Kathy supposedly was a lookout. And Gwen would go in and smother them. And then she would walk out and she would have a washcloth hanging out of the pants pocket, at the pocket in her pants. And that meant she had killed someone that night. And Kathy said that was a message to her to remember that Gwen had killed somebody. It, it all it all kind of makes sense when you when you're you hear about them getting so wound up and beating each other up and then having sex. It, it sounds like they're just psycho. Now, where does forever in five days comes from come from? Well, there's several different stories. I just watched a, uh, a, a clip and supposedly one of the police detectives said that um, whenever there was another killing, the end of the poem would be changed because the end of the poem is forever and five days. It would be the first time it was forever and a day. I love you forever and two days. I love you. Every time they killed somebody, it went up. But here is the poem that she wrote to the woman who she put a loaded gun up her foo-foo-foo and she beat up and apparently scratched her back so horribly that she almost had to go to the hospital several times. Here is the love poem she wrote to Gwen. This is from Kathy Wood to Gwen Graham. I can love you, Gwen. I think you're great. For this afternoon, I cannot wait. That's when we'll wake up, and that's when I'll kiss you. That's when I'll hold you. Oh, Gwen, I miss you. Bunny hop over here and let me lick you on the ear. I want to get married right now, right away. Don't make me wait till the day. When you're mine, oh, please say, you'll be mine forever and five days. And then Gwen wrote back. This is her love note. Just sitting and wishing you were near so I could kiss your cheek and nibble on your ear. You make me crazy. You make me what? You make me want to smile. Just think, I can take you home for WWKs in just a little while. I don't even want to know what that stands for. When we lie down, I want to be in my favorite place so you can hold me close or even, even lick my snotty face. Forever in five days, yes, I'm happy that it's true. You, you my little rat woman, me, your bunny foo-foo. That's where I got the foof foof foof. And it was true for a little longer, at least. Again, we just go through tons of drama, tons of fights. Uh, Kathy, of course, in the middle of everything. Well, all this time while Gwen is saying, I love you, Kathy, I love you. And Kathy's prancing around like a princess, being the queen of everybody in this low paying, uh, these people in these low paying jobs. Gwen is having an affair with a woman named Robin. Now, Robin used to be a cheerleader at her school. She was never, she thought never a lesbian, but she fell in love with Gwen. And when she found out about things like the scratches on the back, tying up the gun, the foo -foo -foo, all of that, she said, we got to get out of here. And Gwen said, I agree. Let's go back to my hometown. So she left Kathy. Now, you've seen how volatile Kathy is. Can you imagine? when she finds out that Gwen has left her with for another woman and they've gone back home, okay? Well, suddenly, Kathy just has to relieve her, her conscience. She can't keep this secret any longer. And she goes to Ken. Ken, I have to tell you, but you gotta, that's her ex-husband. But you have to promise me you're not going to tell anybody. Please promise me. He's like, okay, Kath, what? Why he continued to talk to her and get involved in all her stuff, I'll never know. Yeah, they had a child together, but he would still get involved in all their drama. You know, Gwen would try and punch him. It was just weird. Anyway, Gwen leaves with another woman, leaves Kathy behind. She goes to her ex and he says, I won't tell. Tell me. 
And then she tells a story about how Gwen had got her to be the lookout while Gwen would go and kill these old people by smothering them because they were almost dead anyway. And, um, and she said that Gwen did it because she built up all of this, uh, this anger and it would relieve her when she'd do it. And Ken started thinking, you know, Kathy had such a messed up childhood. This has to do with her messed up childhood. That's why she's doing it is because she maybe now will get some psychological help. And so he says, Kathy, you know, you stood guard. You obviously got something out of this. You need help, Kathy. You need help. I mean, you did this because of your messed up childhood. And she said, no, I didn't. I did it because it was fun. Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing. Gwen started making jokes to Robin. That's the woman she ran off with. They went to Tyler, Texas. They got a little place. And she started making jokes to the point that Robin was just fed up. And the jokes would be like, somebody would say, hey, Gwen, do you think it's going to rain? Oh, I don't know. I, I killed six people. What did you do? Oh, yeah, Gwen says it was six people. You know, hey, uh, Gwen, what are you guys having for dinner? I don't know, but I killed six people. What about you? She just kept saying that over and over and over. And I don't know if she did it because she was accused of it or if she really did it. I don't know. But here's the thing. Kathy, okay, so Ken takes that to the police and he says, you got it. My wife is crazy. She's crazy enough to do this. They start and they talk to Kathy and Kathy claims that she has these letters that her and Gwen sent back and forth where they talk about the killing and that she took a souvenir, that they took a souvenir from each killing. Now, Gwen said to Robin that she was always worried because Kathy took souvenirs from the people she killed. Gwen's saying she didn't. Gwen is saying Kathy did it. Kathy took souvenirs and Kathy wrote letters to her about the killings and she's trying to find these letters because she doesn't want the police to find them. So Kathy tells them about letters and souvenirs that they both took. And Gwen tells Robin at the same time, there are souvenirs that Kathy took. And yes, there are letters. Guess what? Nobody could find any souvenirs. And the only letters found were very blah, nothing to do with killing. But you have, uh, there was, again, five or six, depending on who you talk to. Uh, at least a couple of the people killed were saying, they're killing me. They're here. They're, they're killing me. And I, Gwen and Kathy both said the other went into an old person's room and would say to them, we're going to kill you tonight. We're going to kill you. Whisper in their ear. Well, nobody believed these poor old people, you know, because you, you would just think, oh, they've just got dementia. You know, and then two weeks later, they died. They would not make any connection. Uh, polygraphs, polygraphs were admitted, not admitted, administered. And Kathy failed miserably. And then she um, took another one and it was inconclusive. Uh, I can't remember if Gwen did or not. So really, all they had was Kathy's testimony against Gwen, but she was part of it too. Now, let me ask you, how sick do you have to be to make up a lie that says, that, that makes it so you go to jail for 30 years, 25 years, because that's what Kathy said. She did a plea deal. I mean, she could have changed her mind and said, no, I was just making it up. They wouldn't have done anything. They would have said, okay, bye. Because without Kathy, there's no case. But she admitted, she claims, her part, which was the watch. Gwen said Gwen was the watch and Kathy was the killer. But because Kathy got the deal first, they gave her the best deal. That was the evidence they had that they convicted Gwendolyn Graham of all these murders I think five life sentences to serve consecutively. Kathy got 
parole after, what, 25 years? She was just let out last year. And her parole, she had rules. She couldn't uh, work around children or old people, things like that. All of those rules went poof in June of 2021. Now, I'm going to play you two videos now from news, uh, the news agencies covering this case. One is from two years ago when they go to the parole board and try and keep Kathy behind bars. OK, and the reason I'm going to these is you can see Gwen as she looks now and Kathy. Then I'm going to play you when Kathy gets out. OK, so there's two here. They're about four minutes apiece. So let me hit the share here. Okay, here's the first one. This is going to the parole board, trying to keep Kathy in prison for longer. I think this was 2018. Here we go. In the fight to keep convicted Alpine Manor nursing, nursing Home serial killer Catherine Wood in prison, we have heard from attorneys, her victims' families, and Wood herself. But what about Wood's partner, the woman in prison for life, for suffocating five patients. Target 8 investigator Ken Coker has covered this story since it broke in the late 1980s. He spoke to convicted serial killer Gwen Graham about Wood's possible release. He's here now with the story, new tonight at 6. Brian and Sue, we spoke by phone from the Huron Valley Women's Prison in Ypsilanti, where Graham is spending life in prison without parole for suffocating five elderly women more than 30 years ago. Hello, is this uh, Gwen? Yes, it is. Oh, hi, Gwen. This is Graham urged the families to keep fighting the state parole board's decision to release Wood from prison. But I'm telling you, she's an evil person. She's an evil person. And whatever they need to do to keep her there, do it. But it's not, she says, because she believes Wood is a serial killer. Graham, who is now 55, still insists that neither of them killed anybody. After all these years, I still don't believe that anybody was murdered. I just don't. No matter what a jury found and no matter what appellate judges have ruled, Graham and Wood were both nurses' aides at what was then Alpine Manor Nursing Home in Walker in the late 1980s. They were also a couple. I think a lot of the problem that the town had with me was the fact that I was openly gay. They were charged with killing five elderly women suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia. Wood cooperated with police, telling them that Graham suffocated the women with washcloths while she was the lookout. She told them they were trying to spell murder with the victim's initials. But Graham insists that Wood concocted the story out of vengeance. She was mad at me because I left her while I cheated on her. And... I thought that Gwen was the first person to ever love me. It was Wood's testimony that was key to Graham's conviction. Autopsies on bodies exhumed during the investigation found no evidence of suffocation, likely investigators said, because the victims were not strong enough to fight back. In exchange for her cooperation, Wood got a lesser sentence, 20 to 40 years. Would she serve 30 years in prison just to get back at you? To. I don't think she expected to at all. I think that she expected to get me locked up and that she was going to walk away and go home. I don't think she expected to do a day. Graham said she thought Wood would recant. I thought that when the first year she'd give it up, but she didn't. Last September, the Michigan Parole Board ordered Wood released on parole. She's already served her minimum sentence. Because she's going to do something again. Her victim's families appealed, arguing that she was more involved in the killings than she's admitted, is gaming the system and faking remorse. They believe she'll kill again. As for Graham, she says she has one appeal left. That's your sentence, is to die in prison. I mean, that's yes, what your is. sentence yes, is. is. Do you think Kathy Wood should? I mean, if you are? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. If she's going to take my life, she took my whole life. Or something that never even happened. So for Graham, at least as her story goes, keeping Wood locked up is really about her own vengeance. She thought it was a, a game, and she won, and in the end, she'll win. If I die in here, and she's walking around free, 
she went. Now, a Kent County Circuit Judge has held two hearings on the parole board's ruling. He is expected to issue a ruling soon on whether Wood should be released. Okie dokie, hold on here. Uh, my apologies, I told the story wrong. There was a point in the book where they were going back and forth on who did what, and I forgot Gwen said she did nothing. And at some point, at some point she claimed she was the lookout and Kathy did the killings, but now she was claiming she did nothing, okay? So you have to believe that if there was nothing going on, that Kathy would make up this lie and stay in prison for as long as she did. So here's Kathy getting out of prison now. Okay, so hang on here. Let me do this. Oops, stop that. Let me do that. And mm -hmm. okay, let me just do a couple of quick things here, my darlings. And we'll do this. And we'll do this. And here we go. This is from uh, January 2020. After, After more, more than 30, 30 years behind bars, bars Alpine, Alpine Manor Nursing, nursing Home serial, serial killer, killer Catherine, Catherine Wood is settling into her new home in South Carolina. But her move there caught police and neighbors by surprise. They learned about it only after Target 8 reported on her release yesterday. Target 8 investigator Ken Kolker has covered the murders for more than three decades. He spent the day in Wood's new hometown of Fort Mill, South Carolina. We caught up with Catherine Wood in a neighborhood on the outskirts of Fort Mill, South Carolina after her first night of freedom in more than 30 years. Kathy, Ken Kolker from Wood TV. Just wonder if there's any chance we could talk. My dogs are coming up and off my property. Wood refused to talk. Wood, who is now 57, is living with her sister in a new subdivision on the outskirts of Fort Mill, which is about 20 miles from Charlotte, North Carolina. She is just on the other side of the highway from downtown. It's a small town of about 17,000 people with a police department that had no idea the serial killer was moving in. A Fort Mill police spokesman said that the South Carolina Parole Board, which will supervise Wood, usually notifies his department when a paroled felon moves in. But that didn't happen. I've not received notification from them as of as of this time. Neighbors were also unaware. Oh, I didn't, we didn't know. She was just released on parole yesterday, and she's now living in your neighborhood. No kidding. They basically suffocated elderly patients at a nursing home. Um, for fun. So, so why are they on parole? That's the first question, right? Wood and Gwendolyn Graham were nurses' aides at Alpine Manor Nursing Home in 1987 when they killed at least five elderly patients. Perhaps police say as many as a dozen for fun. Wood claimed that she was the lookout, but police believe she was more involved than that. Graham got life in prison without parole, while Wood got 20 to 40 years and was released after serving more than 30. Target 8 was in Tallahassee Thursday when Wood left a federal prison over the objections of her victims' families. Conditions of her parole show that she will live with her sister in Fort Mill instead of moving back to Michigan. But while the sex offender registry shows 57 sex offenders living in Fort Mill, there is no list of serial killers. Is that something you guys should know about? Uh, seems like it should be something that would be useful information, yeah. yeah. The Homeowners Association president said he plans to reach out to his board and to the board's attorney. I don't know what our options are, if any, you know. Uh, we have a neighborhood Facebook page that, that might be something that we could put that information out on, but on, uh, on the other hand, that may be judged as harassment. Conditions of Wood's parole won't allow her to work with the elderly, with vulnerable adults, or with children. But that parole is up in June 2021. In Fort Mill, South Carolina, I'm targeted investigator Ken Kolker. After more than
Okay, there you go. There you go. So what do you think? Do you think that she would spend 30 years behind bars just to get even with Gwen? I, I don't know. Oh, by the way, another little tidbit here about Lowell Caulfield. His daughter, Jessica Caulfield, is an actress. And did you all see the um, movies with uh, the blonde? Oh, my gosh. Um, Red, White, and Blonde. And what was the other one with Reese Witherspoon? I can't believe I forgot the name. What the heck is the name? Uh, do, do, hold on. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe I forgot the name. Hold on. For the second one was red, white, and blonde. And the first one, legally blonde. Okay. His daughter, Jessica, played, you remember the two women that were like friends and they'd follow Elle around and talk to her and, you know, cheer for her and everything. There was one brunette and one blonde. Well, the blonde, that is Lowell's daughter. She's an actress. So there you go. See, useless trivia. That's what I have to offer people. Don't ever forget that. Okay. Okay. So, Hey, I'll tell you what, let me, um, hang tight. Let me put the link up here. And if you want to jump in and talk about this case or talk about any other case, if you just want to, you know, if you haven't had any therapy and you need me to fix your life, you can give it a try. I'll probably make it a lot worse just so you know. But anyway, there is the link if you want to join in. And let me get rid of this here. I have not been following. I'll put the link up again just to make sure. Click on this link. And if you don't want the video, just all you do is just click on the video and it should put a red X through it and just have audio. Uh, by the way, tomorrow night we have a great guest. Uh, she's a, a dear friend of mine named Donna Kaufman. Donna was a writer on Saturday Night Live, and she is the co-author of many books with Dr. Uh, Cyril Wett, the true crime uh, pathologist, forensic pathologist. And uh, boy, she's got some interesting thoughts on Brian and Gabby's case. So we'll be talking to her, and she's she's a blast. She's really fun. I mean, writing for Saturday Night Live, yeah, that's a big deal. So I don't know how, you know, I, I haven't asked her how she got from Saturday Night Live to like true crime author. That just seems like an odd leap. Ah, this is who I was hoping would call in Friday for Saturday Night Live. Oh, I think you need to turn me down just a little bit. I think it's ready. Okay, we're better? ready. It's I the, the, the window open. <laughs> That's okay. How are you doing? Good. I'm so sorry. I was late. We went a little bit over on our on our live and I apologize because oh, I okay. wanted to get here so I could watch it because I love these. I don't get to watch you every every night. And so when I Well, are you familiar with this case at all? No, I've never heard about it. You gotta get the book. You can get an ebook, you can get an audio book, but uh it, the paperback is like a hundred bucks, which is ridiculous. But this uh you can get I got this used forever in five days and it was mm -hmm. like uh, 20 bucks. You gotta read it because it's crazy. Because it's about a time, especially when um, gay people couldn't come out, so they had yeah. to keep everything, uh, had to keep all these secrets. And and in the book, some people are married and they leave their spouses, and uh, it's just about a lot of violence, <laughs> a lot of violence and craziness and drama. I'm telling you, there is so much drama here. It is you couldn't make up this drama. And it all sent sent in drama? Yeah, I mean, I'm remember? looking over at my wife right now and she's like, <laughs> oh no, not at all. Never happens. I know that's what my, I've been told that before that uh, there can be drama in the lesbian community occasionally, yeah. occasionally. <laughs> but, Michelle's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. It's mostly in this book, the drama cent centers around this. She is psychotic. She's scary and she's out. Uh, her well, name's Kevin. Kathy Don't Wood, move to Utah. You know, she didn't. Thank goodness. She moved to South Carolina, I think. But she went to, um, she claimed that her and her girlfriend, that she was a lookout while her girlfriend murdered all these people in a rest home. And they put her away for 30 years. So, but they had no evidence. They had no evidence. 
I mean, no physical evidence. The only thing they had was her word, and she is a proven psychotic liar. But the thing is, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this, I may have forgotten, that Gwen, when uh, she left Kathy and took with her her then new girlfriend to Tyler, Texas, she kept constantly like making sarcastic comments. Oh, I did say that. Like somebody would say, Gwen, is it going to rain today? She goes, I don't know, but I killed six people. Did you? You know, she would, yeah. She said that constantly over and over. And it's just weird. I, but here's the thing. If she's going to get out, then Gwen should get out. I don't, you know, I don't see any difference between the two. But uh, yeah, Gwen's in there forever. And it's really, it's weird that they had no evidence and they were able to convict her. I don't know. I just don't know. The application of justice is just so bonkers. <laughs> like, like just uh, the differences for the same crime. And, and that's actually why I have a hard time with the death penalty because of the inequities yes. that are involved. Um, me too. I'm the same way. Excuse me while I fix my hair. Copy board. <laughs> that's on. really cute. Everyone was commenting in the chat. Oh, they like it? They wanted it, too. Like, it like this? <laughs> well, not yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. they, yeah. they want to wear it uh, it's, it's the normal way. The normal way. Well, it just was pulling my hair, and now I can see why. Yikes. Oh, yeah, it's all tangled. You just got to cut that. There we go. Woo. Okay, so, yeah, I'm with you. I actually used to be a big proponent of the death penalty, but not anymore because of how uneven it is. My big thing is, you know, if somebody's a vicious killer, the only way you can be guaranteed they won't kill again is a death penalty. And I think it's barbaric and horrible, but that's the only way. And so, you know, what do you do? What do you do? Yeah. You Did can't. you know that they are trying to abolish it in Utah? Yeah, wow. I know. I was like, well, um, how did that happen? Brenda, remember the Lafferty brothers? Brenda. Oh, yeah. Lafferty. Brenda Lafferty. Right. Her sister has been advocating, actually, for it to end and like speaking strictly from a fiscal point of view, like uh, as someone that has experience in economics, like it is a, a so much more expensive. And I was just reading about uh, Ron Lafferty, all of his appeals. And I was just like, how much money did we spend? And then he croaks like a few months before he was scheduled. I know, I know. But then That's again, true. I would have loved, I wish some, okay. Sometimes I'm like, you know, if they televised, I mean, no, that's horrible. But he was such a SOB that. Can I know. say what you and maybe others are thinking? If they televised it, uh, it would be very popular. If they charge tickets, people would buy. That's true. Where they make um, back taxpayer money. Exactly. But it's true. The the If you're looking at things fiscally, the best thing to do <laughs> is make sure it's life without parole. But the problem with that is. There is no such thing as life without parole, because as what happened in California, um, the governor is you know, he put a moratorium on death penalties and these guys might get out. And that's what's scary, you know, because yeah. when they when these killers have shown you who they are, do not give yeah. them another chance. They don't deserve it. You know, yeah. if I could be sure life without parole meant it, I would have no I I, I would be fine with it now. But it just. Yeah. It bothers me. It really does. It's, and people like Ron Lafferty, then the Lafferty brothers, that's who the death penalty was made for. Yeah, you know, for sure. They, um, killed the, they killed everybody. They killed their sister-in-law. And did they kill her little baby? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's horrible. Like, I am doing a video on it, and I'm trying to... I, I'm like, maybe I'm the only like person in true crime that hates talking about the actual... Because I'm, I'm trying to figure, like, how am I going to talk about what this poor what happened to this poor baby um yeah they uh dan lafferty did it and then he was like uh i mean he, he doesn't have any remorse he thinks he was doing god's work yeah it's a it's but, a religious thing it's a crazy religious thing and they were um they were caught i did i tell you the little tiny connection i had to that case yes can i mention it in my yeah book? i did, can well, now were you, was it chloe Lowe or richard stowe that you knew no, no, it was, I'm not sure who it was, but, um, Sorry, it guys, was, you know how I am. I always like get us off topic. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I was at my uh, family's cabin. Uh, I was like a teenager 
and um, it was before cell phones and everything. And it was during this whole time. No, I wasn't a teenager. I was an adult. Anyway, I was up there with my girlfriends and we were out of something, you know, butter or whatever. And my uh, uncle, Herb and Aunt Faith had a cabin just a few houses down. So I said, let's go ask them. I see there's cars there and I'm pounding on the door. Nobody's coming to the door. Now I'm worried. You know, I'm peeking in and finally somebody peeks out and they said that they had been told that they were next on the Lafferty's list and they had to hide somewhere. So they were hiding at my uncle and aunt's cabin. And that's why they weren't answering the door. They thought the Lafferty's were there to kill them. And I'm like, no, we just need butter. We just need butter. We won't kill you. So yeah, that's, that was, I felt so bad, but they were terrified just terrified. So it was, would that be who you were talking about? Those who are, whoever this next on the list, it was these people. Um, maybe what was it like the night of the murders though? Or was it after like, I, you know what? I can't remember. I, I all like, I know is they were up there because they were told they were next on the list and find a place to hide. So you it know, was probably were, like while they were gone, like, uh, in Reno at the circus circus buffet. Yeah, but, um, the Lafferty's were out. They weren't arrested. Oh. Or they were out. And yeah, they didn't know where they, they were. were. Right. Yeah, they had the whole letter that Ron wrote. Uh, right. Yeah, they, they were, I mean. Scary. Yeah. Very scary. You know, my dad's scoutmaster was on Mark Hoffman's kill list. Why? He's in the, he's in the movie uh, Murder Among the Mormons. He's uh, Rust. Rust. He's, he's the, the coin guy. guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. he's my dad's scoutmaster. My dad's like he was the nicest guy. Um, he, he didn't get killed though, did he? No, but he yeah. lost a lot because he trusted. Trusted Mark. Mark Hoffman. Yeah, that was scary. Boy, you guys, we can talk about all kinds of crazy crimes in Utah. Do you uh, do you mind if I add our good friend Lillian Gale here? Yes, please. Okay, Lillian. Mm. Oh, look, she's a she's a moonlight over the ocean tonight. Oh, nice. Lillian, are you there? Lillian, Lillian, I sound like the munchkins on the Wizard of Oz, Lillian, <laughs> don't, don't know the guards, Lillian, where are you, darling, we'll wait for her to come back, okay, well, as far as these lesbians, yes, <laughs> crazy, crazy, <laughs> <Michelle's laughs> <the guy>. um, <laughs> I, I, I joke, because it's my community, and, and there's a, um, thing behind that so mm -hmm. but i'm like could you could you be a bigger <laughs> stereotype like I'm i like, know, Hello. I know. Mullets, mullets galore over there yeah it is they had mullets they had trucks they were tough they beat the crap out of each other you know and but the thing oh she hung up darn it but the thing is um Hi, lillian. <laughs> come on back lillian come on back yeah but come back the um the thing is <laughs> kathy knew from early on that she was attracted to women because the, her first sexual experience, she claimed she didn't know that it was a woman that was actually dressed like a guy. That's yeah. That was her thing. So I was so traumatized. I had no idea she was a woman. Well, I guess everybody knew that this woman that dressed like a guy or young lady or whatever was female. Everybody knew, but he dressed, mm -hmm. she dressed like a, a man. And she claimed, I didn't know. I had no idea. I'd never, never thought about being a lesbian. When in reality, that's probably, you know, unfortunately back then it was shameful. Now it's not. And it's, I, what I hope is one day we don't even have to say somebody is, is gay or straight, that it doesn't, just doesn't matter, you know, yeah. just doesn't matter. So yeah. I agree. Uh, Michelle is over here going, I agree. Michelle and I have different point of views on, on visibility and the importance of that, but um, I find that hard to believe that she was like, oh, yeah, I totally didn't know because she knew. I've been with both, clearly. I have two kids, and I there's a difference. I mean, I, I don't have, like, a wealth of experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stop it. I would put her on camera but she's in her pjs and also she oh that'd be cute though i'm in my pjs this is a nightgown she doesn't have bra she doesn't have bra on oh that's okay oh, well i was gonna say i don't but oh, i do well no um 
I'll show you. T- show me your yeah. tattoo, though. Sorry, guys. Which one? Everyone's like, I don't care. I want to talk about the lesbians. Great <laughs> center. Oh, I like that tattoo. There she is. She's like trying to. There. There it is. Oh, cool. that's nice. <gasps> that is so cool. Now there's a flag, and then what else? The towers. But, ta- oh, the towers. <gasps> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And then it's the uh, police. That's fire. Or that's fire. fire. Three hundred forty-three. That's who passed away that day and then 68 is that port authority oh wow how long did it take you to get that long time um a few sessions god i bet oh that's beautiful that's absolutely stunning thank you she uh she falls asleep during tattoos (laughs) oh my god (laughs) I was the biggest baby. I'm like, wow, give me some liquid pain medicine. Wow. You know, oh my gosh, one day I'll show you my foot tattoo. Oh, how cute. It if is. I could take this, this off and show it to you, I would. It's, it's just hi to you. People are saying hi to you. Hello. Hello. Let me show you my foot tattoo. Okay. It's gorgeous. Where is it? I can't see it. I can't see anything. There's no Wait. tattoo. Oh, wrong foot. <laughs> wrong foot. I thought so. <laughs> That's, oh, wait. I still can't see anything camera on, on this one. That's it because what is I that? Thought, uh, that's the <laughs> tattoo. It's but it's just a little line. Yep. Uh huh. Because I had gotten one for my brother on my rib cage, and yeah. then I was like, oh, I kind of want one for my grandparents. And he was like, yeah, I'll do that. We drew it up. It was a beautiful tattoo of starfish and and everything. And then he started, and I was like, no. And he he took the the pen off and he was like um well you're just gonna have a mark i was like okay try one more time and he did it again and i went no and he goes it was like, just stupid. He just looked stupid yeah yeah and i was like i don't care i i don't care if people can think i have a pen mark on my foot the rest of my life i'm not nope i'm done bye-bye here's your money <laughs> well at least it was the thought that counts you just yeah. stand the needles i guess it would be really hard really sensitive in the in the foot i would imagine yeah i don't have circulate very good circulation i have i have like they're always cold Mm -hmm. um and i don't know why that would make them more painful you would think that it wouldn't but uh, it's crazy crazy. hey have you been uh watching the updates of absolutely nothing new in the gabby and brian case i'm going to put the link up in here again if anybody wants to join us on panel just click on that link that is showing up right now. Come on. I recognize some of your names. Yeah. Come on. Jump in. Weird mom. I saw you in there somewhere. Jenny Penny. Shiva's girl. Yeah. Mary Gold. Uh, Algo. Uh, I haven't I have oh, followed sorry. it today. So I don't know if there's anything new today. I watched Amy's lives. That's mm-hmm. a lot. The oh, she, yeah. She's great. They did it. She did a great um, timeline. For that yeah. which i hope she's going to put up soon oh there she is hold on <laughs> lily and gail what happened oh, hello. oh hi everybody how you doing tonight we he's doing good but where were you we went to you and it was just a beautiful moonlight over water <laughs> well i don't know what i did i can when it comes to these kind of things uh, I, I could do things that I don't even know I do. So oh, me too. Me too. Right. I had my whole tablet off and you were still talking. Now figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm good at stuff like that. Good. Elmom, had, did you see what I wrote in there? No. Uh, in the, in, in the chat. chat? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I probably missed it. I'm so uh, bad. I hope you I hope you got a chuckle out of it. I, I said <laughs> what I said again. was. Did you see it? No, say it again. I I said the first I said the first one who calls in is gay. (laughs) And you called and you called in and I cracked up. I said (laughs) Perfect. 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 To be fair. To be fair. I said, okay. (laughs) So so get yeah. So getting back to those women uh you know if they did it i'm sure they did they're in there long enough uh to prove it i guess that was absolutely horrible absolutely horrible very and you know 
I tell everybody, El Mom, I'm older than you. I'm closer to 72 than I am 71. My birthday's December. Now, um, let me say this. There's good and bad in everyone. I don't care if you're straight, gay, uh, what you are. You should have some kind of morals and standards. Right. But they think, people think that all gay women, all they do, or gay men, they stay in bed all day and just uh, be with their partners. Mm -hmm. They don't work. They don't clean. They don't pay taxes. They don't take care of elderly parents. They don't have nieces or nephews. They're just weirdos. There yeah. are people that think like that, and that's too I bad. You know, therapist that. that, that Par I, pardon me. I I accidentally went to a conversion therapist. Okay. And that was really what the conversion therapist was was trying to push me convert into, it back. She, she all I mean, she was like, ninety nine percent of gay men are nymphomaniacs. I was like, okay. Uh, what man is it? Yeah. I, I mean, like, when you uh, think about it. Let me talk to my husband over here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you know what's sad? <laughs> they think that it's all about sex. Um, and it, listen, we, and I'm saying we, look, um, you know, you want to be accepted and you want to be liked for the person that you are. Mm -hmm. I had wonderful parents. There was absolutely no... Um, incest in my family or anything like that. There was, um, I had two brothers, a father, um, uncles and all that I loved. I wasn't taught to hate men in any kind of way. And I mean, I'm 71 and I realized my sexuality very, very young and had a very difficult time when I, uh, realized that I was different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I really got tormented and uh, I've been with my partner who is now we are legal 31 years congratulations That's awesome she is we are private people mm -hmm. and the people that do know us we are very well respected and very well loved because I don't need to fly any kind of flag. The only flag I fly is the American flag. Okay. I don't need rocks coming through my window. And you know, here's the thing, El mom, when I realized I was different, it took a toll on me mm -hmm. because I wanted to be like everybody else. How old I didn't you, want to William, how old were you? Six, well, I was 16 when I admitted it to my parents, mm -hmm. but somebody had told them. But I knew long before that. Well, you beat me I, by about 20 years. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew that when I was a, a, a young girl, I was very, I was a very, um, I played sports, but we didn't have sports in school like mm -hmm. you do now. And I mean, I could hit a ball farther than my cousin's because they were closer in age. I, I was very athletic and, uh, but I knew I was different and I had so many guy friends, but I never found them. Uh, well, who at my age at the time, the, the sex was or, or anything like that was the last thing on my mind, but it was very painful um, realizing that, I had to tell my parents. So what they did, they took me because they didn't know. It, it was early on. Look, you're going back. I was 16 in 65. So you're going back in the 60s. My parents said, could we take you to a psychiatrist? Because we want to know if we did something. Uh, and I said, yeah, I'll go. And I went. And you know what he said to my parents? What? He said, um. Mr. and Mrs., I won't tell you my last name. Trisha, you'll know soon, probably this week, my real name. I can say it, I guess. Kill no, Martin. No. Okay. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Listen, I we don't know what causes this. We don't know if it's 
but it's not because this is what she wants. These people that prefer the same sex or that way, I believe they're born that way. It's not because they yeah. made this their choice. He said, the best advice I could give you, take her home and love her because she's going to need it. That is amazing back at that time that he, that psychiatrist. Oh, yeah. And guess what? My parents went through hell. The neighbors stopped talking to them. My mom and dad was one of nine. A couple aunts didn't talk to my mom and dad. And my mother and father said, and it chokes me up saying it. My, my, my parents said, look, she's our daughter and we love her. Mm -hmm. And she's a good girl. Right. And, and finally, my one aunt and uncle who didn't talk to my mother said to my mother, you know, Emily, I have a daughter and she's not half as good to me as your daughter is to you and her father. And uh, so they turned around. But I'll tell you, it left many, many, many scars. And that's why I'm 40 some years sober. That was one of the reasons, because I couldn't handle the fact that I was tormented in school. And I said, Mom, Dad, you'll never see me get married, but you'll see me graduate. Well, when I came out of school, when my parents got me a car, the guys were standing out there and they wouldn't let me in the car and they tormented me. They blocked my car. What? They tormented me. They called me horrible names. They, they said, if you think you're a, a boy, you, you're queer. Cause back then it was queer. That's why well, I don't say LGBTQ. Cause it's, it yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? So they finally let me get in my car. They laughed. I got home late every day from school. So I said, my mother said, why are you late every day? And I just said, well, I have to stay for school for this or that. I would never tell them. So one day I couldn't take it anymore. And I told one of my buddies who was a good friend of mine, I said, Gary, take my books back. I can't take this anymore. And he did. And I came home to my mom and dad and told them. So they were unhappy, but I, I cried to them. And I said, I can't do this. My mother said, I'm going up to that school. They have no right treating you like that. So guess what? I went to, to night school. My parents gave me a, a uh, party. I, I got my um, diploma, but I never got my, my uh, tassel that I wanted for my car. Yeah. And I bought myself the school ring, but I'll tell you what, it was hell. And I, and I'll tell you what, the girls today and guys, they come right out with it. And I wish they would hold back a little bit because everybody don't accept it. You don't have to go out there and say, hey, I'm heterosexual. I, I have two kids. Hey, I'm a homosexual. Look, if you're a good person and, and, you, and you, you, you love humanity and you were taught decent, that's all you need to know. Right about a person you don't need to know who they sleep with or, or anything like that unfortunately so, there are still people out there that feel they do need to know that and they do need to judge you by that and that's what trisha there are and 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 now mom let me tell you god said love i don't know what he said love love as i love you so hey look we can talk about everybody and put people down it, it took me a long, long time to be comfortable in my own skin. And I finally am. I don't broadcast it. But if somebody asks me, I tell them. And then, you know what? I say to myself, if, if they don't want to be bothered, then I understand. Because you can't make people understand something like that. You just can't. All right. So That's if they good. choose to to like you for who you are, They'll stick around. And the ones that don't, you, you just pray for them. That's all. And Absolutely. listen, I'm going to let you go. I knew if I got into this, I'd get emotional. Oh, I'm so oh, sorry. You went I'm through glad that. you shared your story because it's yes. important me. for people to know. I'm glad you shared your story because it's important for people to know because there's a misconception that everything's great. Now we can get married. Oh. And it's like I go up to the Capitol every year and I will tell you there's a line out the door. 
and it's not for they're not on my team <laughs> they're on, on no the team. And they i mean look out at- Look at look at Trisha's show. It's about murdered women and children. I mean, come on. Uh, li- li- and life is not all hunky dory. My mother passed away in my arms with my partner of 31 years right by my side. And she stuck by me. And I'm the only one left. Most of my family's gone. And if it wasn't for her, I don't know what I would have done because I really lost it for a little bit. Because my mom and father were my staunchest supporters. Mm -hmm. And uh, my my Nancy here is beautiful inside and out. And uh, we help people when we can. I I have nieces that, that love me, but they do their thing. I rarely see them. And then with COVID. But you know what? It it takes a long time, El Mom, it, it to to feel uh, like you're as good as. And you know what? Once you do that, all the all the people that criticize you or talk about you, look down on you, you know, you, you just have to let that roll off your back because you're who you are. Mm-hmm. I listen. If I would have had a choice, if God said, "Look, do you want to be straight or gay?" Or do you think I want to go through that kind of hell all my life? Right. It's not a question of what I want. It's who I am. And it's exactly. some people start out earlier than others. It doesn't, you know, it's everybody's different. So, ladies, listen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for listening. And, now, and I kind of looked at my partner here and then, well, she's my spouse now. And I said, I don't know. Everybody kind of likes me on Trissa's station. Now they might not like me. No, anybody who doesn't like you for that, they're gone. Because I, I finally came out or said it because of the show you're on. I, now I'm like, now you feel that rejection all over again. You're but you're going to get it, and I know it. You, you are going to get it. You won't. I promise but, you, you will not. Not, not on but, this show. Yeah, no, not. not a, I, I feel like your channel is a very safe it is a safe place. place for me. You're you're supportive at night. Absolutely. It's a very safe place. I'm sorry. Well, that's listen. Thanks a lot, girls. I really appreciate it. Hey, uh, it's it, like I said, it's still a touchy thing and it still hurts, but I live with it. I live with it now and, and I like who I am and we I don't have to deal are. with that anymore. We love who you are, uh, yes. Lillian, and we'll see you again very soon, I'm sure. Take care. You too. Thanks a lot for coming on. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, El Mom. Bye. Oh man, you know I, I love that story. I'm so happy to know that her parents were supportive, because right. you and I both know how many parents are not supportive pro- to this day, are not yes. supportive of their. <laughs> you know, as I do <laughs> right, and so it's good. I mean, that was. A while ago, you know, back in the yeah. early 60s. That was before they took it out of the DSM. They it, were, it, it was, was a mental, mental illness. illness yeah. Until 1972, and I think. So to have uh, Lillian's parents listen to the psychiatrist and stand up and get behind their daughter, that just shows their character, which is mm-hmm. amazing. Absolutely amazing. Hell, my parents wanted to send me to an all-girls school because I was date. I, I, I went out with a Mexican, you know. I mean, really, that's how crazy they were. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's wonderful. But unfortunately, El Mom, we still have a, a way to go. We do. There are still people that believe that gay people are going to hell, you know. And that's okay. It's, We're going to throw a party there. So you're welcome to join us. That's right. Oh. If that's where, if that's hey, the, where gay, the gays can party, maybe not so much the lesbians. Yes. But the they, gays can party. Absolutely. And if every if all my gay friends are in hell, that's where I want to be, too. Right. So absolutely. I hope these ladies go to hell, though. These what? I oh, hope yes. these ladies, these murdery ladies. It, it's a different place for them. We're going to go to the party hill. Yeah, I think they got to like, we got to separate and be like, you are the bad place. Give us your gay carts. <laughs> no, no, we're done. You're no longer with our group. Not hey, allowed. El Mom, uh, tomorrow is El Mom Monday. Yay, it's going to be fun. You have to be on two nights in a row. Now, tomorrow uh, we have coming on Donna Kaufman. Uh, she is a author. Of true crime books she's wrote she's co-written books 
with Dr. Cyril Wett and um, big books. I mean, they're, they're big, big sellers. She was a, uh, on the Saturday Night Live writing team. I mean, she wrote for them. Yeah, she's real, and she's really funny too, obviously. So she's been following Gabby and Brian's case like, like nobody's business. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say. And then after uh, after Dawn is done, then we will go to Elmom because it's Elmom Monday. So we'll see you tomorrow night. All right. We'll see you. Thank you so much for letting You're me welcome. hang out. Everybody, check out the Elmom on uh, YouTube and Kresha's channel, which is, oh my gosh. Difficult so, research. Difficult research. And I'll put both those links in the description as well. Elmom and everybody... Thank you. Thank you, Mods, Ping, Love and Coco, all of you. I really, really appreciate it. So I do too. Talk to you guys <laughs> later. Take care Bye. now. Bye-bye. 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 Insightful one too. Thank you. Bye-bye.